Welcome into Locked On Phillies, and I have one thing to say for today's episode. Get Jers Familia off of this baseball team. We'll discuss in today's Locked On Phillies. You are Locked On Phillies, your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, this is Locked on Phillies. I'm your host, Connor Thomas. been talking Phillies baseball for years on uh, 97.5 The Fanatic on the radio. Now happy to be here with you as your host of Locked on Phillies. And I want to thank you for making Locked on Phillies your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Now, we're recapping the first two games of the Philadelphia Phillies series with the Pittsburgh Pirates out there in Pittsburgh. And you heard it in the open. Jurors familiar is enemy of the state number one when it comes to Philadelphia Phillies land right now. I'll explain why in this first segment as we recap game one. Now, the Phillies got off to a great start in this one. At the top of the first, they scored three runs. Derek Hall tripled the deep right center, scoring Reese Hoskins, scoring Alec Baum. And then Nick Castellano singled the left field, scoring Derek Hall. Three nothing Phillies. Great. Uh, This is all off of Zach Thompson who uh, had a rough start in this one. In the top of the second, will the Phillies score again? Alec Bohm, who's one of the hottest hitters on planet Earth right now, singled to right field. He scored Matt Veerling. Kyle Schwarber moves up to second, and it's 4 nothing Phillies. It was quiet there for the third, fourth, fifth innings, and then in the top of the sixth, well, Kyle Schwarber gets back on the board. He homers to right center, hits an absolute bomb. It's a three-run shot that scored Matt Veerling, scored Garrett Stubbs, and it's 7 Nothing Philadelphia. And then in the top of the seventh, with the Phillies still shutting out the Pittsburgh Pirates and Zach Wheeler still absolutely dicing. Well, Didi Gregorius singles to right field. Nick Castellano scores. It's 8 nothing Phillies in the top of the seventh. This game is all but over, right? Well, in the bottom of the seventh, Zach Wheeler gives up a two-run home run. And that's basically where his day ends. So it's 8-2, to uh, still in favor of the Phillies. And you only got a couple more outs to get. So, hey, that's all right. So who comes in for Zach Wheeler in the uh, bottom of the ninth? Well, actually, the Phillies would go to the pen and they do fine. But then in the bottom of the ninth, Juris Familia gets an opportunity with a score at 8-2. to two. And Juris Familia promptly goes through and gives up five earned Run so it goes from eight to two to being eight to seven with the tying run on base. Now, Sir Anthony Dominguez comes in and immediately gets the final two outs. Juris Familia was able to record one out, but Juris Familia was absolutely terrible. He can't throw strikes when he does throw strikes, he gets absolutely demolished. And the Pirates are frankly not a good baseball team. A competent major league pitcher, and we've seen so far this series is the case, a competent major league pitcher can get this lineup out no problem. They have a couple nice players. Brian Hayes, good bat. Brian Reynolds, good bat. Um, O'Neal Cruz, a good bat. But they only have like a handful of guys that even deserve to be playing at this level right now. For Juris Familia to face this team in that type of spot and not be able to get results is ridiculous. He's been absolutely terrible this year. It god awful what Juris Familia has been for this baseball team. And I don't understand how he continues to pitch. I, I really don't get it. Now, let me tell you my theory as to why they haven't DFA'd him yet, because they still haven't sent him down. He didn't get sent down for game two, even though he almost blew the entirety of game one, made it actually a safe situation for Sir Anthony Dominguez. Uh, it, it's not great. And Juris Familia, well, he only technically went one third of an inning, gave up four hits, five runs. Every one of them earned one walk and only one strikeout. He's got a six ERA right now. He's only struck out 33 people all year. He just he doesn't have anything at all, and he's continuing to just get worse as the season goes on. He's shown no signs of improving, and he's the only player in this bullpen, which has been really, really good, that's actually holding this team back from being where they want to be. And call up Mark Capel. Call up Francisco Morales, who hasn't gotten a chance at the major league level this year. You have other guys, but I imagine here's the reason why Juris Familia hasn't been moved. 
there's only a certain number of options for certain guys. And there's only a certain number of moves that you can make with the roster. With the trade deadline impending, I'd imagine the Phillies are going to wait to see who they can add before they make moves. And then if there's still a roster spot that's open for Juris Familia on the back end of the trade deadline or open for some pitcher, that's when they, I imagine that they'll be sending Juris Familia down and they'll be calling up Mark Capel or somebody else. I think they're waiting till the back end of the trade deadline. I don't think Juris Familia is going to pitch again before August 2nd because he's unusable right now against even the lowest levels of competition. So I think he's done pitching in a Phillies uniform. But I don't think the roster move will come until the trade deadline is over. It just shows you, though, that the Phillies certainly need one more high leverage arm to throw in the bullpen because Juris Familia is unusable. Who are the relievers we trust right now? Well, obviously, Sir Anthony Dominguez. Brad Hand has been really good. Uh, Jose Alvarado has been really good. Connor Brogdon had a really big opportunity in last night's game. We'll talk about the second game of the series. We're recapping the first game of the series right now. Those are all trustworthy guys. Nick Nelson in early spots. Corey Knabel in like the sixth or seventh inning. Not as a closer, but earlier in the game, yeah. Like these are all guys that you can absolutely trust, and they're the reason why the Phillies bullpen has been as good as it's been. Even Andrew Bellotti in some instances, has been really, really good. But, man, Juris Familia just absolutely cannot be allowed to pitch for this baseball team anymore. He almost cost you what was going to be a great game. Now, let's go back and look at the positives because I've done enough ripping of uh, Juris Familia. We all agree he stinks. He should never pitch for this team again. Let's talk about guys that don't stink. Zach Wheeler went seven innings and two runs, two earned. Only allowed three hits to the Pirates and struck out eight. He was outstanding. Once again, his ERA down to a, uh, what is he officially at? A 277. I believe he's uh, like, he's unbelievable so far this year. Corey Knable, looking at it, has got a 272 ERA. He had a scoreless outing. Sir Anthony Dominguez, a scoreless outing. Like the bullpen has been good besides George Familia. They've been dominant, and the pitching against the Pirates was really, really good outside of one guy. Kyle Schwarber. Gets back on the board with three more RBIs and a home run. That's great. Reese Hoskins went two for five in this one. He's starting to heat up. If you listen to my players that should play above expectations level episode, I picked Reese Hoskins and Nick Castellanos. Castellanos went three for five. He's really starting to heat up. The power numbers aren't quite there, but the average is up over 250. Alec Bohm is up to 294 average-wise. He went two for five. He's one of the hottest hitters on planet Earth. Matt Veerling was two for four. Garrett Stubbs with a hit, Didi with a hit, Bryson with a hit, uh, Derek Hall with a hit. Everyone in the Philadelphia Phillies starting lineup had a hit. They finished with 15 in the game. They scored eight runs, all eight RBIs and everything like that. It's just, yeah, just beautiful. Only struck out six times. When you score more times than you strike out, that's a really, really good sign for a Philadelphia Phillies lineup. So, hey, uh, the team is looking good. They're taking care of business out there in Pittsburgh. We'll talk about game two here in a second, where the Phillies also took care of business a little bit closer of a game and something that would be interesting to be gleaned in that one about some players that will carry you to success. But with Gene Segura right around the corner, uh, this team is looking really, really good. The only major weak spot I see with the Philadelphia Phillies right now is the fact that Juris Familia cannot throw innings for this team. But outside of that, the bullpen's been really good. The starters have been really good. The uh, defense has been all right, but they've been overcoming it. Some of the players that have been slumping offensively have started to get back into it. J.T. Armuto, Nick Castellanos, Reese Hoskins starting to hit their weight when it comes to uh, how much they're getting paid and what's expected offensive production-wise. I mean, this is a team that looks like a playoff roster. And they're starting to round out in the form. They're getting hot at the right time. Let's see how long they can remain hot. Because outside of two games with the Atlanta Braves, a relatively easy stretch of the schedule coming up as we get into early August. So, hey, all good things in game one. But the question is, would they be able to carry that over to game two last night? It wasn't as easy, but they did get it done. And I'll tell you all about the heroics late in last night's game on the next set into, on today's Locked on Phillies. All right, let me tell you about my friends over at Blue Nile. You might be ready to pop the question. You might only be looking for a milestone moment jewelry like bracelets, earrings, necklaces for like some type of anniversary. Whatever it is, you can find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. You can have a perfectly 
customized engagement ring with a diamond shape, size, clarity, setting style, all up for your pick. You can make that whatever you'd like it to be. And the fine bench jewelers at Blue Nile will help you create that perfect ring. They also have experts on hand 24 seven available via phone or chat to help you pick some fine everyday jewelry if you're not looking for an engagement ring. So make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And going on now is the Blue Nile anniversary sale. You can save the 40% on classic fine jewelry pieces and up to 25% on engagement ring settings, plus every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging. They won't give away what's inside, so shop stress-free and find your forever piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. All right, it's time to preview or preview, <laughs> recap game two of the Philadelphia Phillies Pittsburgh Pirates series. And what a win it was for your Philadelphia Phillies out there in Pittsburgh last night. It was not the ideal setup for a win, but hey, the Phillies got the job done. Now, going from Zach Wheeler to Bailey Falter is not the ideal way you want to go as far as a pitching rotation is concerned. But Bailey Falter was really, really good in this one, considering what he was tasked with having to do. Now, he gave up a run in the bottom of the third on RBI double to the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, it was a little bit of a, a, a tough inning there for Falter, but he worked out of it. And then Cabrian Hayes homer to right field to make it 2 to nothing. That was in the bottom of the sixth inning. But from the first inning to the sixth inning, the only two runs scored were by Pittsburgh, and we're on those two plays there. Bailey Falter, pretty darn good as far as the start's concerned. The Phillies offense just didn't have anything going. Then in the top of the seventh, well, the Philadelphia Phillies finally made hay. Banuelos comes in, pitching for Pittsburgh out of the bullpen, and with Matt Veerling on base and Odubel Herrera on base, Matt Veerling on second, Odubel Herrera on first, Kyle Schwarber takes a two-out pitch and rips it to right field. Absolutely smokes it off of the fence and right. Looked like it would have had a chance to get out if we were at Citizens Bank Park, but that big wall in right field in Pittsburgh at PNC just knocked it down. But either way, it was a single for Schwarber. Matt Veerling scores easily from second since there were two outs. Odubel Herrera makes it to third base. Now, a bit of an issue on this play. Kyle Schwarber smoked the ball, and it seemed like Odubel Herrera slowed up and stopped running as he rounded around second base. Like, I don't know. He thought it was gone. He thought it was caught. I don't know what he was thinking because it's a really, really dumb baseball play. Now, Odubel Herrera ended up scoring anyway. Reese Hoskins came up next, and with two outs, he singled the left field, scoring Odubel Herrera, moving Kyle Schwarber up to second, tying the game at two. So Reese Hoskins, a game-tying RBI single in the top of the seventh inning, a big at bat, a big hit by Reese Hoskins, who went perfect on the night, batted a thousand in four bats for the Philadelphia Phillies in this one, but uh, or maybe he had five. I guess see how many at bats he he had. It hits in every single at-bat registered, though. So good work by Reese Hoskins. And he scores Odubel Herrera. But when Odubel Herrera scores and gets back to the dugout, Rob Thompson did stop him, talk to him very sternly, seemed to be saying to him, hey, man, you can't stop running there. I, I don't care if you wouldn't have scored. It, it's unacceptable to have this happen at this level of baseball, for you to just stop running in the middle of a play where you are the game-tying run on a ball hit off the fence. So – you got to put more effort in there. You got to be smarter there. It, it's unacceptable for that to happen. And we know Odubel Herrera plays a very, uh, how do I put this? He plays dumb baseball. I'm, I'm not going to be nice about it. He, he plays stupid baseball. He, he has a very uh, bad approach to the game, in my opinion, as far as approach at the plate, as far as playing the field, as far as base running. He just doesn't play an intelligent game. When it comes to making the right decisions, putting in the right effort, this, that, and the other thing. He doesn't do the little things well. He does some of the big things incredibly well. A solid bat, a major league player when it comes to the outfield. But all those little things make him annoying to watch play. And it frankly makes him not as good of an outfielder as he could be if he played a smarter style of game. And Rob Thompson had every right to criticize him for that situation. It could have cost the Phillies hugely. Thankfully, with Reese Hoskins, it did not. But... The Phillies were then locked in a little bit of work as far as the bullpen is concerned. From the bottom of the seventh, well, the Phillies have to work through some issues. They get out of it. The bottom of the eighth, the Philadelphia Phillies 
get out of it. The bottom of the ninth comes and goes with neither team scoring, and we're headed to the 10th inning. Bailey Falter had a good start, but Brad Hand takes care of business in the 7th. Jose Alvarado takes care of business in the 8th. Sarantia Dominguez takes care of business in the ninth, and we are heading to the 10th. And in the top of the 10th, will the Philadelphia Phillies – the Philadelphia Phillies had a runner on second to start the 10th with, of course, the MLB special base runner rules for extra inning in the regular season. That runner was Garrett Stubbs. And while a catcher isn't exactly considered to be the best option to be the runner when you're looking for a single scoring your game or your go ahead run, well, it wouldn't matter. Reese Hoskins goes down 0 2 in the first at bat of the inning and then gets a fastball played at a little bit low in the zone that he goes down and gets hits at 410 feet to straight away so uh straight away center and he scores himself and Garrett Stubbs absolute nuke a huge at bat by Reese Hoskins it was his second and third RBIs of the night following his one that tied the game so Reese Hoskins tied the game at two with an RBI single and then put the Phillies up 4-2 to two in the top of the 10th with a huge, huge two-run home run. Reese Hoskins' night, just to remind you exactly what he did at the plate out of the two-hole. Well, yeah, he went 4-4 four for four with three RBIs, a walk, and a home run. And just a monster, monster day by Reese Hoskins. Then in the bottom of the 10th, because those are the only two runs the Phillies would score, in the top of the frame, Connor Brogdon was tasked was shutting down the Pittsburgh Pirates. He didn't even give up a hit. He struck out one, got a couple of fly outs. The runner on second that the Pirates had would not even score. A great inning for Connor Brogman, perfect inning. And the Philadelphia Phillies win 4-2. to two. A gutsy 10-inning comeback win against the Pittsburgh Pirates. I don't care who you're playing. I don't care how talented the other team is. A major league team that's up 2 nothing on you in the seventh inning, that's going to be a tough game to come back and actually win. And beating a home team in extra inning scenarios with a runner starting on second, also very difficult to do with the new rules. The Philadelphia Phillies took care of business for both, and it was a huge, huge win for them with some big at-bats. Kyle Schwarber only went one for five, but had a big swing with an RBI single. One of the four runs scored was off that single that he hit off the wall. Garrett Stubbs scores the go-ahead run in pinch running. He was over in his pinch hitting, uh, or actually, sorry, he just pinch ran for Kyle Schwarber, who would have been that runner uh, as the DH show. Uh, Garrett Stubbs does what he's supposed to do, even though all he had to do was walk around the bases. Alec Bohm went two for five. He continues to be incredibly hot. Nick Cassianos, two for five, continues to head in the right direction at the plate. Matt Veerling, two for five, had a nice series so far out there in Pittsburgh. And the real Guy who carried the Phillies was Reese Hoskins, four for four, three RBIs, one run scored himself, one walk, a perfect day at the plate for Hoskins with the go-ahead two-run home run in the top of the tent. It was beautiful, and it was also nice to see that the Phillies' bullpen in some high-leverage situations was able to get done what they needed to get done in shutting down the Pirates late and securing the win. So it's two wins for the Phillies in the first two games of Pittsburgh. Game three is tonight. Now, in our next episode, in the whole new episode, we're going to preview Game 3 of the series with the Pittsburgh Pirates. We're also going to look forward at an interesting series coming up, and I'm going to talk you through some theory that I have concerning what's going to happen with the Philadelphia Phillies' schedule the rest of the way. I'll break that all down. But in the final segment today, rather than previewing Game 3, which we're going to give a little bit more time to, we're going to do stepping off where we take a break, step outside the lines of baseball. I have some tales from behind enemy lines for the second time this year. I was in the Braves clubhouse for the series with the Atlanta Braves, and I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the things I heard said in the locker room by those Atlanta Braves players and how they pertain to the Phillies. We'll wrap up with that next on Locked on Phillies. All right, let me tell you about Built Bar. There's a new flavor coming out, Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs. They're awesome. You know puffs, what they are. They're the marshmallow, protein-infused marshmallow. Well, now they come with cookie dough chunks in them, 100% real chocolate on them, and listen to this, only 160 calories, whopping 15 grams of protein. you got to run over to Built.com, snag a box for you and the family, or maybe you can just find a good hiding place and keep it all for yourself. But they're really, really tasty, and what's great about Built is that all their bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently 
provides tons of health benefits. You're going to love the new cookie dough chunk puffs. So maybe you need a snack, a late night treat, or just a quick bite. This is perfect for all of it. Run over to built.com, use promo code LOCK15, and we'll even get you 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, it's time for stepping off. Now, if you're not familiar with stepping off, it's like when a pitcher steps off the rubber. Sometimes you have to step off, take a deep breath, and then you step back on and get zoned back in on the game. So it's kind of like our midweek break from just breaking down the game or talking trade deadline or stuff like that. And for the second time this year, I've got tails from behind enemy lines. Nothing too crazy being said in the Braves locker room uh, this time around. One thing I will say, I noticed that I thought was funny. Now, I don't know what player said this. I don't know who said it. I don't know exactly what was said. So I'm not going to attribute a quote to anybody or anything like that. Don't want to get in trouble for doing anything. Here's what I will say. There was a point uh, as players filtered off the field uh, that they were very much complaining about how annoying Philadelphia Phillies fans could be with maybe some expletives sprinkled in there. I don't know what player it was. I didn't see exactly who it was. It was just something I heard down the hallway while we were in there talking to Brian Snicker, the manager of the Atlanta Braves. So I'll say this first and foremost, the Atlanta Braves, they get very annoyed at Philadelphia Phillies fans. And you saw points where Ronald Acuna out in right field was getting some ribbing from the right field stands. Yeah, you saw some other Braves, uh, I mean, interacting with the fans a little bit, not quite to the extent that Acuna was in game three in the day game in the afternoon. But still, clearly, some of the fans were getting under the skin of the Braves players, and you kind of love that. That's one of the advantages in Philadelphia. So Phillies fans, if you ever think that these players really think you're annoying, oh, they do, and don't ever change because it's a nice home field advantage. Some other guys we got to talk to besides hearing that and talking to Brian Snicker, the manager who got his 500th win against the Phillies. Well, we heard from Charlie Morton, who had a little bit of a rough start for the Atlanta Braves, talked about not being able to control his pitches. Spencer Strider, who just dominated in game two uh, against Aaron Nola. He's a very good young arm. He, that's a guy that you're going to have to watch out for for the Braves for a long time. Has a lot of confidence and gave us a great postgame interview talking about Austin Riley and which one of them would win in a matchup with Strider on the mound, Riley at the dish. But one of the most interesting Phillies facing things that I think I saw was the Braves losing two games in a row. They lost their series ender of the series before they came to Philadelphia to play the Phillies. And then they lost game one to the Philadelphia Phillies. And it was the first time all year that they had lost two games in a row. They're still the only team in Major League Baseball to not lose three games in a row all season. But there was a uh, there was a little bit of not so much concern, but surprise in the Braves locker room with how the Philadelphia Phillies played them. That'll just show you not only are the Braves super confident in how talented their team is, but they were very, very impressed with what the Philadelphia Phillies did. And you can tell that they have respect for the Phillies, the level of a playoff caliber team. They didn't have any players expressly say, okay, well, the Phillies are a playoff team. But you could tell by the way they talked about them that this was not a throwaway team. This was not a uh, just another team in the division. No, they view the Phillies as equal competitors to them. A very talented offensive lineup. A lot of their players mentioned that, and some of the pitchers mentioned that. And it was uh, it was interesting to see some of the uh, incredulous looks that uh, we got after the Phillies won game one and after the Phillies won game three. So a bit of a weird series, but the Braves clearly respect the Phillies, and that's something I've been trying to preach all year. This roster, well, they just carry the weight of a playoff roster, the names, the talent level. Will they be one? Time will tell. I think they will be, but this is a talented team, and their peers and other teams in the division have certainly taken notice. So those are some tales from behind enemy lines, just to give you an idea of what the Braves' perspective is on your Philadelphia Phillies. Now, that's all the time I have for you for today's episode. I want to thank you for making Locked on Phillies your first listen every day. Now make your second listen Locked on MLB. Paul Francis Sullivan, he's awesome, knows baseball inside and out. He's going to bring some humor, tell some great stories, share some history of the game while he's covering the top stories from around Major League Baseball in general. And a lot of great stuff going on right now with the trade deadline. So make sure you're locked in 
on Locked On MLB. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And please continue to subscribe, rate, review, do all that good stuff that helps me get interaction for Locked On Phillies and helps improve your listening or viewing experience. That's all I've got for you. And we'll be back tomorrow to preview game three and talk just a little bit more fun stuff with the Philadelphia Phillies.